choices. The choices I make today affect my family's tomorrow. Choosing to build discipline so my children can make wise, godly decisions. Choosing faithfulness. Choosing to lead. Well, good morning, Boulevard. Hey, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is Family Emphasis Month, and I'm just going to tell you right now, we have got some fun stuff planned for you, all righty, okay? Uh, we're looking forward to, oh, 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 what do we got? What do we got? Well, no, no. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Well, hey, listen, I want to take that opportunity to tell you about another opportunity, all right? If you are up for a little bit of fun, and you don't have to be young for doing this, one of the funnest things I did this whole last year was a great big old Nerf gun war uh, with my grandkids and my, uh, and my boys, all right, who are grown-ups. And uh, gosh, it was so much fun. And so we are going to provide that opportunity for our church on Friday night, October 14th from 6.30 to 8.30. All you got to bring is your Nerf gun, all right? So your job is to go out and find the biggest, nastiest Nerf gun that you can find, all righty? We're even going to provide the bullets for it that night, okay? We're going to kind of clear the church, all right, and uh, just have a big Nerf gun war. We hope you'll come out and be a part of that. A sign-up will be there to Welcome Center next week. We'd like to know you're coming so we can just know how big of a battlefield to prepare, all right? Well, folks, again, this is, this is Family Emphasis Month, right? And, and if you have been around uh, Boulevard very long, you know that that family is really important. It is so important that one of our six core values is about the family. Healthy families or strong families make for strong communities. We believe that here, all right? Uh, it, it, is, it is just a part of what we do. And we have committed the last, the last uh, at least a week, uh, or excuse me, a month out of each year for the last 30 plus years to talking about family issues as we see God's Word telling them. If you haven't been around here a long time, all right, hang around. You're going to find out that family is important here at Boulevard and that we really do believe in that core value and we believe that we are strengthening our community, strengthening the lives of people as we take time intentionally to strengthen the lives of of families, all right, in this area. Well, hey, listen, I want to want to tell you something uh, that I, um, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pinky swear anyone to this, okay? But uh, but I I'm going to challenge you. I am going to challenge you to be here for these next four weeks, all right? Um, I, I've just uh, sometimes as I read scripture, I'm always uh, I'm always amazed how much family there is in scripture from Genesis to Revelation. There's this idea of family, and I don't know if it's just for me because it's my particular passion, but sometimes it does, those family issues, those principles for the family, just kind of seem to leap off the page. And I was, was doing some reading just on my own in First and Second Samuel uh, just uh, in the last, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, and, uh, and all of a sudden God just began to kind of bring some of those family principles that I had never seen before from those two books and begin to put it out in front of me. And we went to James and talked to the staff and said, hey, here's where I Here's where I believe God is leading us for Family Emphasis Month. I'm just going to tell you that I am really excited, incredibly passionate right now about some of these things, and I really would like you to be here. They are things that are, that are eternal lessons, things that I want us to know, and they are also things, I'm just going to be honest with you, they are things that I see sometimes us struggling with in our church, in our families, in our culture, in our community specifically, all right? And so I hope that you'll come out and be a part of that. Matter of fact, I'm just going to up the ante on the challenging a little bit. And that is I'm going to encourage you to consider someone that you could bring to this. Because honestly, I don't know anyone that believes they have all the answers when it comes to family stuff. Now, if I can tell, talk with you just kind of personally for just a moment, I'll tell you this too, something you probably already know, that when I get passionate about something, uh, I have a tendency to kind of bear down. You've probably noticed that before, all right? And when it comes to Family Emphasis Month, 
as much fun as I think family is, and I want my own family to be, and I want yours to be, I have a personally, when I begin to teach about it, it's, I, I have such a passion in my heart that, that I have a tendency to kind of kind of put the foot down pretty hard. So I'm going to promise you, all right, that I'm going to do the best I can not to bear down, to squish all the joy out of this stuff, even though some things that God has placed in my heart, I'm going to do the best I can at the same time at the very same time, I want you all to know that this is stuff that is vitally important, that things that, that, that I believe God wants us to know. Well, we're talking about today, in case you're wondering, we're talking about family. And actually, what we're talking about specifically today is the idea of building discipline into the lives of our children. Building discipline into the lives. When we start talk about the word discipline, I mean, what happens? We begin to kind of think, oh, that's negative. And so, so this, you know, leading off, this is kind of a tough one not to bear down on. It has a tendency to be negative. But it doesn't have to be. I don't believe it has to be at all. And, and I would even tell you that in God's incredible mercy, uh, in, in the fact that, that God is a, a God of reality, and maybe more than anything, there's that God is a God who I absolutely believe loves a good laugh. This is kind of what happened to me this week. So I'm pretty much, I've been working on the sermons for, for the last two or three weeks off and on, and I told Dawn, hey, I think I've got Sundays down. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much ready for this thing. That was Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday night, our oldest son and his wife, Drew and Amy, who are celebrating the 10th anniversary, had asked us if we would keep their three youngins from a Tuesday till tomorrow, which is pretty much a full week, all right? And so they bring, them, they bring them Tuesday night, and, and they get ready to leave on Wednesday morning for their, for their anniversary trip. And, and so one of the last things about 1030 that Amy says to us is, in preparation, I now know, man, Hadley has really been tough. I mean, we are disciplining her. We, I, I, we, we are not finding anything that works with Hadley right now. Well, Hadley is their youngest, and Hadley is three years old, and Hadley is the sweetest thing on the face of the earth, all right, and, and I just, we just love, I just love her dearly, but she also has kind of a last child, don't tread on me syndrome, if you know what I mean, all right, and so recently, just a couple things, so you understand that all of a sudden, something I, a lesson I had completely prepared, all of a sudden has changed remarkably in the last four or five days, and there has been this sense of reality that has come on it, you know, all of a sudden, I realized that, that, um, that there are some things that I have to kind of relearn and think about. Uh, it seems like that at, at some point in time, several weeks ago, uh, Ella, who is the oldest of the three, came out, came out crying, you know, went to Amy, says to Amy, uh, Mom, Mom, uh, Ella, or excuse me, Hadley, Hadley hit me. Hadley hit me. So, you know, she goes through the Hadley, come out here, you know, and she sets her down and she does whatever a parent does. Hadley, why did you hit her? Hadley looks her right in the eye and says, I did not hit her, Mommy. Well, then now we're talking about lying. I did not hit her. Why did you hit her? I did not hit her. And then she looks right at Amy and she says, I punched her. <laughs> a couple weeks later, they get a new cat named... Uh, ironically, Gracie, all right, uh, Gracie needs a lot of grace in that house, and, and so uh, they go to, they go to uh, Hadley, and uh, Hadley's got this little uh, reputation pretty quick on of, of hitting the cat, kicking the cat, all the, you know, these things, and so they sit down with, 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 uh, with Hadley, and they say, uh, Hadley, um, do, don't hit Gracie, don't hit Gracie. She looks up at him with big blue eyes and she says, I know hit Gracie, I know kick Gracie, I know punch Gracie, I know pinch Gracie, I know poke Gracie, I know pull Gracie's tail. You think you just heard a little confession there? <laughs> so Wednesday morning, so Wednesday morning, here's just, I mean, I'm, going to, I'm not going to take you to the whole week, but so Wednesday morning, I get up and I spend, and I spend most of the morning uh, finishing, on my, finishing on my remarks for a, 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 a 
lesson that I did on Thursday morning for about 400 uh, 7th and 8th graders, uh, what we call a boys bash on sexual purity and abstinence, which falls right in line with this whole idea of discipline. And then Wednesday afternoon, I took the afternoon off and went home and stayed with the kids while Dawn was working. And, uh, and so, you know, I was just reminded again, just reminded again of of that, the, the idea that this idea of discipline is not necessarily negative, but it is tough. It's a, it's a difficult road sometimes. It takes, it takes doing the same thing, the same repetition over and over sometimes as, as a parent. Well, I told you earlier that we were looking at, that I was looking at Samuel first, uh, first and second Samuel. And the story that we're looking at today, all right, the story that we're looking at today is found in the very, very beginnings of first Samuel. And if sometimes you find when you read Scripture, if you, if you just kind of back up a little bit, sometimes you'll find that God presents this beautiful story against a very, very ugly backdrop in a sense to, uh, to kind of make you see the beauty of the story. And then sometimes God takes this ugly story and puts it against a beautiful backdrop to kind of let you see the ugliness of the story. I mean, it just kind of takes it up, takes ugly up another notch. And this particular situation, this story that we're looking at today, is definitely the latter. This is a backdrop of a story that many of us know, a story that starts out 1 Samuel, chapter 1. It starts out with a, a woman named Hannah and her husband named Elkanah. And, and if you know the story, they are trying hard, hard, hard to have children, and they cannot have children, and she is in grief. And we won't go into all that, just the fact that, that there's this, this, this story about them warning children, and they finally have an opportunity to have a child. And they have Samuel, and, and she commits Samuel to the Lord, that he will serve, that he will serve the Lord all his days. And it ends up that he, she ends up taking Samuel, actually, and putting Samuel to raise in the hands of the priest of Israel at that time, a man named Eli. And in, in chapter 2, you begins that, that Hannah has this incredibly beautiful prayer to God for all the things that God has done for her and praying against her enemies and those who have, who have met, gloated over her and made fun of her when she was barren. And so you look at, you look at the first few verses of of 1 Samuel 2, and you see this gorgeous, beautiful prayer, and then things change. And all of a sudden what we see is this, in verse 12 of chapter 2, we read this startling verse in the middle of this beautiful, beautiful story. It says of this man who was given a responsibility to raise the next leader of Israel this, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. And so what you see for the next chapter or so, you see this, these terrible things that they're doing, basically providing spiritual abuse and spiritual bullying to the people who are bringing their sacrifices. I mean, they're taking their choice of the best meat that is offered to God. And they're basically just saying, I'm gonna, I'll beat you up if you tell anybody about it. Bullying at its highest level. And then it goes back to Samuel. It talks about Samuel growing up in the presence of the Lord and, and the fact that he's growing in his faith. And, and then it bounces back over to these Eli's sons. And it says that as women are approaching the presence of the Lord or approaching the temple, that they are actually having sex with these women at the, at the, at the opening of the, the, the tent or the area where, of, of the, where people are going to worship God. I mean, this, these, guys, these guys are bad. The attention begins to focus then to Eli. And God sends someone to Eli and he says basically, he says basically this. You've known what was happening. You've known what was happening and you did nothing about it. You've known what was, about it, what was happening and you've done nothing about it. And he says, and he says basically, he says, he says to Eli, your house is going down. He knew about what was going on in his, in his son's life, and it says he failed to restrain them. He failed to restrain them. It's crazy, isn't it? That, that a man who is entrusted with the life of a person who will be the leader of the nation of Israel, chosen by God, for whatever reasons... For whatever reason, will not has not taken the time, and we're not given the full. We're not given a full story. We're not, we don't go back to in the background of these boys too much. We just know at this point in time in their lives as an adult, what is happening in their life. They have no regard for the Lord, no regard for His people, and God says of him, "You knew, you knew what was going on, and you failed to 
restrain them. And 1 Samuel 2, 2 stands for us, folks. It stands for us as a very, very clear picture, as a very, very clear sign, as, as a strong reminder that God's expectation for you and for myself, for us as parents, is that we will discipline our children, that we will refrain them, that we will put perimeters in their life. That is a reality, and we understand from this that he takes this very, very seriously. Well, you know, when we talk about discipline, when we talk about the idea of discipline, man, I mean, I said before, it be, it's easy to get negative. It's easy to think, you know, golly, that's so heavy-handed. And, and it's easy to get this idea of, of small children walking around the house, you know, you know, in lockstep with, with mops over their shoulders or something, you know, and saluting mom and dad, you know, and all the, all the rigidity that we think can come with this. But I think, I think there's so much more. I don't think that that is that's the spirit of discipline that God has in mind for you and I or for our families at all. Matter of fact, as we were thinking about this, one of the staff members brought up this particular verse, and I thought, you know what, that is more than fitting. That is an amazing definition of really what discipline is. So in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, it says this. Paul is writing to his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy. And this is what he says. He says, how from infancy, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Teaching, okay, the Holy Scriptures teach us which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for, and here's where I think really we find out the, what the definition of discipline is in our lives for our kids. It is useful for teaching. It is useful for rebuking. It is useful for correcting. It is useful for training in righteousness. Who's the best teacher you ever had in your life? Think about it for a second. Who's the best teacher you ever had in your life? Why? What, what did that teacher provide? What, what did they do to guide you? What did they do to, to get you to really learn? Not just have a head knowledge, but really learn the subject. What, what did they do to, to create that passion in you that you didn't have before for that particular sport or that particular subject or that particular issue? Who is your best teacher? See, I, I think sometimes when we think about God's Word or how it disciplines, how it guides us in our life, we have a tendency to think that God's Word is this negative, Nancy kind of a thing. And see, I don't see that as true at all. As a matter of fact, I would just tell you right now that I believe, I believe God's Word in spirit and in truth is absolutely the best guide to parenting that you will ever read. I said not only the truth of it, but the spirit of it. Because primarily it's a very, very positive, encouraging book. Who's the best teacher you ever had? It says that God's word is, is rebukes us at times. And, and that's probably of all these words, it's probably the, the harshest. And certainly as we are building discipline into our child's life, there's a, there's a place for teaching, but there's also a place for rebuking. That, that, that time when, when our children our children are absolutely bent on doing the wrong thing. And we correct and we teach and we guide. At some point in time, we come to them, we look them in the eye. And without getting personal about it, without raising our, raising our voice, we let them know that this is a very, very serious offense. There is a time. There is a time for that rebuking. God's Word, it says, the perfect teacher, the perfect disciplinarian, is also good for correcting it's, it's correcting. I, th I think of this idea. I think of the idea of that, that when we correct our children, when, we, when they are obviously made a wrong decision or they are on a wrong path, that especially early on, that in correction, we have to take the time, we have to do something where they will begin to associate that wrong behavior with pain. That they know. That they know when they, when they come to the Y in the road that if they, if they choose this path, it's a good path. It's a pleasant path. It's a pain-free path. But if they choose this one, there will be pain involved. How about training? Now maybe if, if, if rebuke is the harshest one, maybe training is the toughest one. Because training is, training is 
training, isn't it? I mean, training is repetition. Training is that, is that just, you know, you go and you do it and it just doesn't seem to have any fruit. It's just like, it's like getting in shape. You don't ever really feel like you're getting there until you actually get to the race and then you realize, hey, it all paid off. A guy by the name of Brian Jennings, who, uh, who leads a church in Highland Park, uh, Highland Park Christian Church in Tulsa, has recently, read, has recently written this book. It's called Lead Your Family. I very highly recommend it. We have bought a number of copies. It's in the bookstore for $5. It's an excellent buy. He talks about at some point in time they realized their kids were getting both rambunctious on summer mornings and bored on summer mornings. And so they begin to build into their kids' lives just a little bit. Okay, before you do it, you must eat. You must brush your teeth. Uh, you need to spend some time reading God's Word, and you need to do your chores. And when you're done with those things, then you can play, at this point in time with the culprit, then you can play video games for this certain amount of time. But not until you do these things. They were training those child as, children, as he says, they were, they were beginning to, as parents, trying to create an appetite for the right things in their children. And training them... Training is that. It is, it is us working to create an appetite for the right things, to prepare them for what is up and coming. It takes teaching, and it takes rebuking, and it takes correcting, and it takes training. All of those things are part of building discipline. It also means, it also means that we have to understand our child's personality. Now, I love, you know I love talking about the personality stuff. And, and I was just reminded that this about uh, two or three weeks ago, our second son, Lane, and his family were there. And we got talking about some things, that some responsibilities at his job that have been given to him just in the last month or two that are pretty weighty responsibilities. And we were talking about some, a profile that Lane had taken uh, to kind of, kind of a profile help him see what his leadership strengths and weaknesses were. Because there's a pretty fair amount of leadership uh, needed for his role these days. And he said, hey, Dad, you know what? Surprised he says this to me. He says, you know, one of the, one of the words that came up when, when I was doing this profile was the word persister. Persister. Not a word you think about too much. You think about persisting. Persister. He said, I thought that was interesting. This was the son who repeatedly time after time, maybe millions of times, would come to me as an adolescent and, and say, after I had said no to him, he, he would say, this was his byline, he would come to me, he would say, hey dad, I'm not arguing, but. And we would, and we would go through it, you know, now tell me why I can't, well, here's, you know, here's, here's the rule, and, and, and as much as I could tell him about the why, I would tell him the why. And he might disappear, and, and he would come back to me. And you know, you know what the line was going to be? Hey, Dad, I, it's kind of like Abraham's prayer with God. Hey, I'm, I'm not arguing, but. And so the day he stood in my kitchen here a couple weeks ago, you know, at 32, age of 32, and says that his leadership profile told him he was a persister, only one of us was surprised. But here, you know what the cool thing about it is this, is, is I had, that used to drive me crazy. I mean, he was polite enough not to call it arguing, but it was what it was. But man, he was persistent. And that used to drive me nuts. And I used to like, come on, man, this is ridiculous. Why do we have to go through this? And you know what's happening now? That is, that is, that is mentioned as a leadership strength for him. He stays after it. He doggedly pursues. He persists. So sometimes the things that we see as weaknesses in our kids, if we're not careful that we're trying to train out of them, are actually things that God can use in their lives. I want you to notice real quickly before we go on about this passage that it says that it is useful for leading us essentially to salvation, all right, understanding salvation, and then thoroughly equipping us for every good work. And I would, I'll just say this, that as we build discipline into our lives, our children's lives, that we prepare, that we are preparing their hearts for faith in God that they are able to hear what God has to say to them, his correction, his rebuke, his teaching. 
his guidance so they can, they can be led and their hearts are ready for salvation. And then they can be thoroughly equipped. They can have the tools needed for the things that he has prepared for them to do. See, the goal of discipline, don't miss this, the goal of discipline, folks, as for us as parents, is to prepare our child to make wise, God-led. I'm not just talking about good kids. I'm not talking about just moral kids. We're talking about our, the goal is to make wise, God-led decisions now and into their future. That's the goal. The tough part, the tough part is, is as you and I as you and I are building, this idea of building, as we got the hammers out, as we got the screwdrivers out, as we got the measuring out, as we're, doing the, we're doing the sawing, as we're doing all those, we're doing all kinds of it. It's, 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 it's hard work. It's tenacious work. And we can do it and we can do it. And sometimes, if we're honest, we don't see anything being built, do we? So after Amy has told me on Tuesday evening, hey, we're tried everything for Hadley and nothing seems to work, I think, well, hey, Pops, Pops will take a swing at this ball. So Wednesday afternoon, she's got this little thing going on, you know, and, and her, her brother and sister will upset her, and she just screams. I mean screams, all right? And, and, and Pops doesn't do screaming well. And so I go to her, and I sit down, you know, and she's three, and she's looking at me, these big old, you know, blue eyes, and I'm saying, Hi, Hadley, I love you, and you are a good girl. You are such a good girl, and you're a big girl. And, and you know, screaming, that's not a pretty thing. That's not something we want to do, and that's not something we're not going to scream when we're at Pop's house, all right? And she looks at me, and she says, Okay, Pops, I won't scream anymore. Anymore meant for 22 minutes. <laughs> anymore meant for the next time that her brother and sister annoyed her, and she felt completely out of control, and then the screaming began again. We have had a number of conversations we have had a number of conversations about, about screaming and even some sit-outs and some, some different things. And, you know, it hadn't happened too much. It's happened less than it did, but it's still there. And sometimes kids don't seem to be getting it at all, and sometimes they get it slowly. Our, our other young, young uh, four-year-old, uh, Knox, who is Lane and Kelly's youngest child, uh, just recently, uh, just we, they were at our house, and I think we'd had some donuts and they had been, I ate a, like about a dozen and a half a piece or something like that. And Knox is, you know, Knox is four. And, and, and he, uh, he went back in. He asked his dad, you know, if he could have one more chocolate donut. And his dad said, Knox, no, you cannot have the chocolate donut. And he had eaten a little bit of chocolate donut, I think. And he said, Knox, Lane just said to him, Knox, here's what's going to happen. If you eat that donut, if you take that donut, then I'm going to take you in the back room and I'm going to spank you. You understand? Yes, I understand. Lines were clear, all right? Okay, he knew exactly what was going to happen. About five, seven minutes later, we're sitting in the living room, in the living room you know, having a conversation. And Knox literally walks from the kitchen right past us with the chocolate donut in his hand and chocolate around his mouth, okay? And he walks right past us, right back to the back bedroom. See, he wasn't there, he wasn't all the way there, okay? I mean, he was still, I mean, he had waited out, man. He had come to the Y in the road. Okay, this is going to be painful, but man, chocolate is good. I mean, he had decided he was going to pay the price, you know? And you know what the cool thing is? He got exactly what his daddy told him he was going to get, as cute as it was. And that's, that's the process. That's them finally beginning to stop at the wide in the road and look both ways and go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I know what's going to happen. It's a process. It's a process. Hey, why don't we build discipline? I mean, I think about that. I mean, none of us is perfect in this area. I, I can look back on the lives of my four boys. I can look now at my grandchildren, even when they're home, and I can, and I can see the look at the times. I was like, why wouldn't? Why didn't I take the time to build discipline? And remember, we're not just talking about correction. We're not just talking about when they've done something wrong. We're talking about building the character of discipline into their lives so they can make wise, godly decisions down the road. Why don't we do that? I think there's a lot of reasons. I think one of them is because we, we build and build and build and don't see anything built. 
sometimes. We don't feel like we see progress. Because as Amy said, sometimes we've tried this, 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 and this, and nothing seems to work. And you just kind of give up sometimes. Sometimes we're just tired. Wow, I think about single parents sometimes. I know it's hard enough for two parents in the home. And I think about single parents just having to stay at it day after day after day, never being able to pass it off to anyone else, never be able to just go in the room for a few minutes and settle down. I think about that. I think about the busyness that we get into in our lives. And uh, folks, I'm just going to tell you, and you know that this discipline thing, this building discipline, it takes time. It's got to be a priority. And if there's something going on in your house constantly all the time, there is no time to build that discipline into your child's life. Sometimes we're fearful. Maybe we've been abused. Maybe it's we've seen it. And so we, we just don't want to do anything that might be seen or might be viewed, you know, that from, from that and we stay away. And then there's less honorable ways. It's kind of an interesting thing. I wish I had a little bit more time to look into it. Do you realize that, that just right after it talks about that, that, that Eli's sons were actually stealing the best torch of the meat, in the next chapter over it talks about the fact God comes to Eli, and Eli, we find, is actually participating, not in the bullying, but he is eating some of the choice meat. He is eating. He is participating. He has, in the sense of what I would call, he has, he's allowing what is going on because he is enjoying the fruit of it. There is a need there. He's not participating, but he's enjoying the fruit. And you know what? Sometimes, I think sometimes we don't discipline. We don't discipline because we need something from that child. We need their acceptance. We are insecure enough fearful enough. We need their friendship. We don't want them to say, I don't like you, Daddy. I don't like you, Mommy. We don't, we won't, don't want to see those things, and so we back away from the very things that God has placed in our hands to do to build that discipline in our child's life. Folks, the faint parenting, <laughs> parenting is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the insecure. It's not for the preoccupied, and it's not for those who are too busy, for those who are too insecure. It's tough. It's a tough thing. It's slow sledding. And so let me just walk through really, really quickly, okay, before I close. I want to I walk through this with you, all right? I believe that Tim Kimmel says these three things in one of his books, all right, that it basically takes these three things in our lives to build these three things into the lives of our children. The first is this. The first is, Tim Kimmel says, that it takes delayed gratification. That we can either just live life as a pleasure up front all the time and never face the pain for our kids, and we teach them to do the same thing. They never face the pain. Knowing life, he says, will be painful, we schedule the pain. That's delayed gratification. Knowing life will be painful at some point in time, we choose to schedule the pain. Tom Landry, who is a very famous coach and very successful coach of the Dallas Cowboys, said this. He says, I have a job that isn't complicated, but it is often very difficult to get a group of men to do, catch this, what they don't want to do to achieve what they have wanted to do all their lives. That's the role of parenting. And when we do that, we begin to develop in our children's lives freedom. Freedom not to be controlled by all their desires and all the whims and everything that comes their way. They have the freedom because that has been built into their lives. It gives our, 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 our sons and daughters freedom to have sexual purity because, they're not, because they have made a decision ahead of time. It gives them a freedom to, to go into college and be ready for the dog days of college and to study and do what is necessary to pass the course. It gives them the freedom to make good decisions in their finances. When we will take the time to discipline them and build discipline by delaying gratification. Number two is this, advanced decision making. Advanced decision making. Not blown by the wind, not by a whim. But, 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 but we, we make decisions before the wind hits us, before we face the storm. We know where we are going. And so we build that into their lives. Advanced decision-making becomes possible because we have a focused goal. 
in our lives as parents, we know what we want to build ahead of time into the lives of our children. I'm surprised sometimes when I ask parents, what do you want to build into these kids' lives? What's the most important thing? And they really stutter a little bit. But when we know as parents what we want to build, what God wants us to build in the lives of our children, then we can take the time to build that focus goal into their lives so they can make the right decisions. My dad asked us for years growing up at our house, hey, where do you think you want to go to school? Where do you think you want to go to college? What do you think you want to do? You know what he was doing? He wasn't blowing up, drawing a target necessarily on the wall for us. He was just make, getting us to think ahead. And as we thought ahead to school, to college, and what we wanted to do, we begin to make plans now to make sure that we are studying, to make sure that we are, have the grades, to make sure that we are the kind of people who could get into a university or college of our choice and go the direction that God had for us. My dad signed me on early to, to work at a place called Arctic Circle when I was in eighth grade, a dollar an hour. A focused goal because he wanted to create a work ethic in his children. And so he, took, he was intentional about finding us summer jobs even when we were young. Folks, I, I, uh, I really, I've got, I've got, I have more things that I want to share with you. I, I think discipline is this. I think discipline is that we make sure that extreme is not the standard. I think discipline is, building discipline is the idea that, that yelling never achieves what we would think, we would like to think it achieves. I, I think discipline involves something that I failed at oftentimes as our kids were growing older, not taking into account Dawn's opinion on things, believing that God had spoken to me about what the discipline needed to be. And God has provided oftentimes in a man and a wife a, a balance of kind of harsh and soft and if you can find some middle ground which is hard to do but it's possible that's important I think it's drawing clear lines for our children so they know when they when they know when they cross the lines and it's holding them responsible it's making sure that they understand what the that the consequences will will absolutely be without a doubt and that they can count on that happening it is consistency not the fact that every child is disciplined the same way, but if you say you're going to do something, you follow through with it. And it's catching them doing well. So when they finally get it, that we make sure that they know that we have seen them do it right. Corporal punishment or spanking has been tossed out the window in a lot of places now. You know, it's been, it's been poo-pooed. But there's two things about it I want you to know about, about, corporal, about corporal punishment, about spanking. One... I abhor abuse, and corporal punishment or spanking done correctly is not abusive. It's not. The other thing I want you to know about it is it is, it is given credibility, credence in Scripture. It is talked about a number of times in Scripture as a credible way of correcting our children, of allowing them to see that this choice is associated with a particular painful uh, painful experience, especially when they were younger. It can be used very effectively. We would take our children. When the line had been drawn, we would take our children. We would say, hey, we told you if this happens, here's what's going to happen. They knew it. They took the responsibility for that. I would take them in or Dawn, I would take them in. We would explain what, would ha what had happened to them. Oftentimes when they were younger, I would have them bend over my knee. I wouldn't use my hand. I would make sure that I was not angry because anger in adult scares a child, and that's not what this is about. This is about corrective path of discipline. We would take, we would take what we, a uh, little paddle, you know, one of those paddles with the little rubber ball. Ours, for some reason, when we bought it, had the words lucky hit on it. <laughs> I would bend them over my knee, I would give them four or five swats on the back end. I would stand them up. I would place them on my knee. I would look into their eyes and I would say, you know what you've done wrong. You know why you received this. And you know that I will love you. Your mom and I will love you regardless of anything that you ever do. That love is unfailing and is unconditional. And when they leave the room, it's over. 
You don't hold on to it. You don't remind them again. That's not God-like. That's, that's, not, that's not unconditional love. And so when they leave, there's a certain swiftness to it. It happens and then it's over. They, they associate the pain with the decision. But it's done, and it can be done right. It can be done well. It can be done absolutely without anger, and it can be done very, very effective. It doesn't have to be something that happens every time, but it can be very effective. And I believe if my boys were here to say, to talk to you today, would tell you that it made a positive difference in their lives, and they are using it in the lives of their children in a godly, biblical way. We could say more, but that's probably enough. Folks, At the end of the story, Eli's sons die. God's word says very, very clearly that if we love our children, that if we love our children, we will take the time to discipline them. His boys die at the end of this story largely for lack of discipline and the abuse, their disregard for God. And Eli dies. Upon hearing of their death, it says he is sitting on the long side of the road, and he is heavy. He is a heavy man, it says. Maybe from eating all that meat that he should never have eaten that was being offered by other people, he falls over and he breaks his neck and I'd like to believe, maybe, that he also died from a broken heart, realizing that he did not do what God had called him to do as a parent, building discipline into the lives of their sons so they could accept also the discipline of the Lord. Because you know what, folks, there's, there's a bigger question here. There's a bigger issue than just having ch children who, are, who have discipline in their lives. If we do not discipline our children, and they will not accept our discipline. They will not be taught to accept the discipline of the Lord. Hebrews 12 says, My son, we have that. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? It addresses you as a father and addresses, addresses you as a father addresses his son. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens those he accepts as his son. He loves us and disciplines us, and he disciplines us because of his love. We want to build children into our children's lives the ability to make wise, God-led decisions as they learn to accept discipline from us and later from God. And then for us, for you and I today, there may be something happening in our life. There may be something that feels a little bit like God's heavy hand on us, that he is trying to get us onto a path that he desires. He loves us so much that he will discipline us. He will correct, he will guide, he will rebuke, he will teach, he will chasten so that we can come into and know his love and know his salvation and know his path and path that he has for us. Folks, we invite you, we invite you this morning, one into a family of believers who believes in family. We'd love to have you come be a part of that if you've not. And second, we would love to have you enter into the family of God through a faith in Christ, something he has already done for us. Thank you for listening so well this morning. I appreciate it. Let's stand.